All right, so we're going to look at uh, part three, and that's going to be England's limited rule. So in other words, the English monarchs uh, had didn't have as much power as the rest of the kings and queens that we have already been talking about. So uh, doing this one from outside, I don't know if you can see it or not, but I'll show you that direction over there. That's the lighthouse over there. I don't know if you can see it in the background. My dog is somewhere. Yeah, there's my dog. Dog's down there on the on the ground, I'm trying to take a nap while I'm doing this. So, all right. So, limited monarchy or limited monarchs in England. How they differed from a lot of other places. In England, monarchs were never able to establish absolute rule, as their fellow monarchs had had done in France and, and Russia. So not like Louis or, or the czars that we've talked about. Already in the Middle Ages, strong checks had been established on the English king's power. The big one, of course, is the Magna Carta. In 1215, English nobles forced King John to sign the Magna Carta, which guaranteed that Englishmen could not be fined or imprisoned except according to laws of the land. So whatever is in the Magna Carta, the kings have to follow it also. So John also agreed not to raise new taxes without the consent of the barons, which are the lords. And the Magna Carta demonstrated that the king's power could be limited. So the rise of parliament, what would happen is as the as these barons would meet or you know, decide if they're going to have taxes or not, they just kept meeting. And this ends up with the English government, which is their parliament. So parliament was established as a legislative body, so to make laws. And it's made up of two houses. You have the House of Lords, which is your nobles. And then you have a elected house, which is the House of Commons. So the, this is the side for the common people. So new taxes needed to be approved by the parliament. So that's when they started meeting. And then they eventually end up making, they become the, the English government. And this is where they meet. Here's Big Ben over here. So England's road to limited monarchy. So what happens in England is one king after another kind of gives up uh, some of his authority and you have what we have today where the king has the king queen have no really have no authority at all. So later events turned England into a limited monarchy in which subjects enjoyed basic rights and power, which was shared between the king and the parliament. So officially back then England had a limited absolute monarchy. All right. After the Magna Carta. Uh, a lot of those powers just keep being taken away. So they have a limited monarchy. The British kings uh, rule with checks and balances of power described in the Magna Carta. English kings still, but uh, even during this time, they, they still tried to gain as much power as they possibly could. And of course, Henry VIII breaks from the Catholic Church, and he seeks to increase his own power and that of the, the monarchy in the late 1500s. So he needed parliament to break away from the Catholic Church, but he also tried to increase his power. So some of the different ruling families, the, the Tudors. In the 16th century, Henry VIII and Elizabeth I were the two uh, real big Tudors. And they created a strong centralized monarchy, and it was based on a sense of national unity. So the uh, the English were very unified as a people and the church. They also had the Church of England. So they had separated from the Catholic Church. They had the Church of England. So that made them different from a lot of different places and completely different from almost everywhere else is power that was shared between the monarchy and the parliament. Henry relied on parliament to approve his break with the Catholic Church in Rome. So here's Henry VIII. Here's Elizabeth I. Another group of monarchs or ruling families. Okay, were the Stuarts. So James I became king in 1603, and this is when stuff starts to change. Um, you know, actually, the English kings try and gain more power than what they had before. So James believed in divine right of kings. So he believed that kings were chosen by God, and he's going to come in conflict with Parliament, but not as much as his son. So his son Charles I tried to establish absolutism and collect new taxes without Parliament's consent. He imprisoned those who refused to obey, so he did everything against the Magna Carta, pretty much. And when the House of Commons questioned why he was doing these things, Charles just dissolved the whole parliament, which means he got rid of them, and he ruled without parliament for 11 years. Then you have a rebellion in Scotland, 
and this forces Charles to bring back Parliament, ask them for help, ask them, you know, to uh, supply money, army, things like that. So he needed their help in 1640 to pursue his policies in Scotland, afterwards to go and try and crush the, the Scots. Uh, but they, they still continue to disagree, and this is going to lead to a civil war. So the English Civil War. So the, conflicts, uh, the conflict soon leads to a civil war between the king, people who were on the side of the king, and people who were on the side of the parliament. Army reforms were introduced by parliament that helped win the civil war. So really the army ends up, the main part of the army ends up being on the side of the, of the parliament. So in 1649, Charles I is tried and he becomes the first English monarch to be executed. So for a short time after Charles I, England is actually a republic where people just voted for their representatives and things like that. But eventually they go back to being a monarchy. So when Charles II was restored to the throne in 1660, he agrees to limit his royal power. And here's a short video on the trial of Charles. So this is the House of Commons having the trial, and then you'll see uh, you'll see Charles come in.
All right, so that was the uh, trial of Charles the First. Uh, after that, you have what's called the Glorious Revolution. It's not really a civil war. It's not really a revolution. It's called the Glorious Revolution because really uh, only only good things happen in this. So a second English uh, revolution occurred when James II converted to Catholicism. So he converted from being Protestant, Church of England, to being a Catholic. And he failed to respect many of his subjects' rights. So he tried to, uh, he really wanted everybody else in England to convert to Catholicism. Uh, angered by his actions, Parliament deposed, which means they got rid of James II, and they invited James' daughter and her husband to take his place. And here's a painting from uh, the execution. You can see how much the actor looked like uh, uh, Charles I. And you actually see people afterwards, they were mopping up the royal blood and trying to save it, save it sell it, things like that. So Glorious Revolution. So during the Glorious Revolution, what you have is in 1689, you have William and Mary. What you see here, uh, they're the new rulers of England, and they agree to the Bill of Rights, which established Parliament's supremacy over the king and other, other rights. So once you have the Bill of Rights, the kings pretty much lose their power. So William and Mary agreed that they would neither collect new taxes nor raise an army without obtaining Parliament's consent. So these events mark the final shift of power from the kings to the parliament. So now parliament is going to have more power than the king. And um, parliament's never been challenged again by another English king. 